So my goals were like, all right, I want to give them some shade because everybody likes shade. I want pigs to be excited to eat all the time. And I want to produce really happy pork. And so why don't I just plant orchards for pigs and basically one of my multi-structured orchards where I have pigs in the understory that are, apply, that are giving me annual income. And then I'll have like cider fruit. But I also want to have orchards that feed these animals. So pigness of the pig was one of the big goals. Pigs and trees. A dangerous combination or a delectable harmony? My name is Hannah Hemmelgarn, and in this episode of the Agroforestry Podcast, we'll hear from hog silvopasture practitioners, Eliza Greenman and Dana Burtness. And I'm calling in my colleague, Dr. Ashley Conway, assistant research professor at the Center for Agroforestry, whose research focus is silvopasture. Dr. Conway is going to step in as this episode's guest host. What's your take on all of this, Ashley? So hog civil pasture generates a lot of interest and with good reason. This type of civil pasture harks back to one of the oldest management systems for hogs that we know about, which is the Dehesa system. So in what is currently known as Spain and Portugal, covering and including the Iberian Peninsula, this method of savanna grazing is estimated to be nearly 2,000 years old um, in these oak forests with lots of cork oak and wild pear. Mixed species grazing has been happening for a very long time. We even have 14th century art reliefs of pig herders going and knocking sticks against oak trees to drop the acorns or the mast for their pigs to forage. Um, there's even a word for this process. It's called panage. And its definition stems from a legal practice that included releasing livestock and pigs into forested areas, either royal land or common land, at a specific time of year as a right to forage the dropped mast in the fall. So savanna management, to be clear, is not unique to Europe, but with European colonization, this practice, this panage that was inspired by the Dehesa system was imported to North America. Here in North America, savannas were being managed primarily by indigenous nations for uh, non-domesticated animals using fire. So when the colonists arrived, applying their practices seemed like a one-for-one, one, almost a no-brainer to utilize uh, North American oak savannas. Currently, civil pasture is gaining momentum as a method for savanna restoration to overcome and repair some of the colonial legacy that has changed the composition of our woodlands and forests. At this time, let's hear from someone who's trying this method. My name is Dana Burtness. Uh, my husband Nick and I run Nettle Valley Farm, which is a small 70-acre uh, farmstead in southeastern Minnesota in the Driftless area. We, I've been farming on and off since I was 19. I used to be a vegetable farmer, but now I've switched over to pastured pigs. That's my main enterprise on the farm. This past year we finished 50 heritage breed pigs on pasture and in the, in the woods, and um, we raise them up on certified organic, uh, corn-free, soy-free, fish meal-free feed, so it's mostly peas and barley. And then um, we run them through areas with black walnuts and acorns and various woodland plants. And we're just sort of um, dabbling with silvopasture in our uh, black walnut and pine plantation. How did you become introduced to silvopasture? What, what was the shift for you from annual production to, to hogs? Honestly, I, uh, it was... I got Lyme disease really badly and I had to, it forced me to quit annual veggies because I just noticed that my health was declining. The area, the soil of the, the area that I was uh, renting, that soil health was declining and it just started, it prompted this bigger idea or this bigger sort of inquiry in my mind about, okay, like what am I doing with my life? And I was introduced to holistic management at the same time, which just blew everything up. Also at the same time, I was introduced with, to the concepts of permaculture, restoration ag by Mark Shepard, um, regenerative ag, uh, agroforestry practices. And so as I was recovering from Lyme disease, I worked with Mark Shepard for a couple years, um, helping him with uh, his teaching endeavors and then starting to do some uh, earthworks and um, water management system installs. And that entire process just led me to really realize, like, I am a livestock person. Mm -hmm. And the way 
the best way to do livestock seems to be to think from their perspective about what they need and try to mimic nature. And that's why we've modeled our pig system in the way that we've, we have. So do you have mature walnuts or um, what was your process for establishing the silver pasture area here? We, you know, I've, no. we've lived on our farm for five years now and I haven't planted a single tree. So we have 70 acres, 50 of it is wooded. And so we actually need to be doing much more savanna and civil pasture by subtraction instead of addition. We have very little open land, and what we do have, we for now want to keep open um, as pasture. Um, so yeah, it's a 35-year-old pine and walnut plantation in, in desperate need of thinning, but um, in the really hot months of the summer, it's great for pigs. It's great for pigs in some ways. Um, and then we've learned, it's been a steep learning curve in terms of the crazy extreme weather events that we're now having on a weekly basis. Now it's totally normal for it to pour for five days in a row. And that is very tricky with pigs. Yeah. Very tricky with pigs, even on the most well-established pasture because of their nature, which is they, they love to root. And there are certain strategies you can use to reduce their rooting but um, in my experience thus far, it's, uh, it's part of the true nature of the pig. And um, I'm still figuring out how to harness that and use it in a way that honors what they need to do to be happy, but also what I need to do in this like, changing climate to, to actually build soil health and not, not destroy it. Yeah, so I imagine you're rotating on a pretty tight schedule. Yeah, um, we move the pigs at least once a week. However, in certain areas of the farm that were more recently just annual row crops or say in the pine and walnut plantation where there's no sod layer in there because the trees are, have, haven't been thinned, um, no amount of rotation would keep them from rooting up. I mean, I'd, I'd literally probably have to move them every 20 minutes and I'm not going to do that. So how are the trees faring in that? So far, so good. However, it's only been a few years. Uh -huh. So we'll see. Um, and I am such a newbie at this stuff. I'm still in the middle of that learning curve about how to do true silvo pasture as opposed to just pigs in a pine plantation, about how we can actually start getting more of the pasture layer and uh, uh, utilize the, the gifts of the trees and then make it work for the pigs. Um, I am such, I, since I am a pig farmer, that's naturally the, the perspective that I see things from. So I think I'm willing to accept some damage to the trees if it's what benefits the pigs. But obviously I'd like to work towards a system where all three are thriving. Yeah. But I'm not there yet, um, especially at scale. It's one thing when you have four pigs, mm -hmm. but when you're finishing 50 and we'll, prob we'll likely increase to you know, 60 to 70 pigs next year, um, that's a different ball game. Because if you've got 60 to 70 pigs in an area and it rains for five days in a row, um, and they're 300 pounds. What How big are the, of an area are the paddocks? It totally varies depending on the season and the size and uh -huh. the type of pasture they're sure. on. But anywhere from a quarter of an acre to a, a whole acre. And we use all temporary electric netting. Mm -hmm. um, but the, it's so much harder to, to nimbly rotate pigs in our system um, because of the, you've got to schlep around so much stuff with pigs. It's not like with cattle where you barely have to give them water and mineral. It's tons of water, tons of feed, literal tons of feed. So even the act of getting into a pasture after it's rained to be able to move your feeder, that can be destructive to soil health, you know, after they've rooted it up. Yeah. So yeah, really interesting challenges. Um, so I'd like to, I would love to be able to join forces with um, pastured pig farmers who are doing things on scale across the country. You know, folks who are finishing 50 or more um, pigs on pasture every year just to start talking about, okay, let's look at these soil health principles. How do pastured pigs fit into that? How does that, how does silvo pasture fit into that? These are big questions. So this idea of utilizing livestock, particularly pigs, as a tool for savanna restoration, it's very exciting and it's full of potential as a practice and a this strategy for woodland management. Um, but Dana brings up some of the challenges associated with keeping pigs in the woods and I think this really speaks to the non-prescriptive nature of civil pasture in general. 
What she really makes clear to me is that these practices are not a one for one. What has worked historically for 2,000 years in the Iberian Peninsula is not going to directly transfer with 100% success to a place with different climate, different weather patterns, different soil, different wildlife, etc. But to me, that doesn't mean we can't be inspired by our local conditions to adapt this system to something that will really work for our region and our area. Um, another practitioner, Eliza Greenman of Hogtree Farm, is doing exactly that. She's a fruit explorer, a horticultural historian, and a designer and implementer of agroforestry plans that integrate livestock and humans into tree crop systems and orchards. So here's how it all started. I, um, I'm not from a farming family. I don't have any inherited land. I don't have any uh, family at all living that are farmers. I am the only one. And it happened when I was uh, living on an island in Maine. I have a forestry degree. And a friend of mine asked if I knew how to prune any of the apple trees in Maine uh, on this island. And I said, no, I don't. Uh, but I'll find somebody. And I found this wonderful man, Phil Norris, who's a Apple tree, apple tree pruner, piano tuner. And he came out to the island because he knew he could, he could tune like 10 pianos while he was there. And so he came out to the island and, and we were working in this one tree. And when I was in that tree, um, everything made sense. My whole, it's like on a cellular level, something just snapped in me. And it was like, this is what I need to do for the rest of my life. And so when I came out to my parents that I wanted to be an orchardist, they, uh, <laughs> they told me that my, well, my mom didn't like gossip to my grandma about it. Like, oh no, what do we do? And, um, and my grandmother was like, you know, Eliza, you, we're all really related to uh, your great, great, my great, great, great grandfather was a famous orchardist in, in North Carolina. I was like, oh, I had no idea about that. And she's like, and we're really related. That goes into a wreath at, at some point. So I'm doubly related to this famous orchardist of North Carolina. And my, so I have a family apple called the Dula Beauty that's still around today. So anyway, my... My, I couldn't stop thinking about apples. Right after I took that workshop, I pruned every apple tree on the island. I did a terrible job. I, like, the, one of the big things is if you learn these things and you're excited about it, just do it because apples are really forgiving. And then later on in life, I've fixed those trees from the damage I did. Um, but uh, I then try, I was just desperate for a mentor. Um, and so I first. Uh, mentored under, uh, or apprenticed under John Bunker of Fedco Trees. And that's where I got like a taste of real diversity. Uh, I think he, he runs a heirloom apple CSA, aside from Fedco Trees. He runs an heirloom apple CSA that I think, I think we must have harvested 200 different varieties of apples that year, um, all throughout nor orchards of Maine. And so I got a real sense of uh, you know, some of the diversity within just apples. And one of, those, one of the orchards we harvest out of, harvested out of was uh, Francis Fenton of Sandy River Apples. And Francis Fenton was a third generation orchardist, a very long lived orchardist. He's 90, he was 97 in this picture. And that's when I moved into his house and started um, learning from him and helping kind of being the physical side of his, of his orchard. He's some, he would tell stories about like having a, uh, a Civil War veteran scything the understory of his orchard. Um, and then he would talk about the uh, Green Revolution and how everything was so hard. And then the Green Revolution happened and everything became so easy. And so I, that's where I, I got... I had access with Francis to about 140 different varieties of apples, so I really started to get to know them intimately. But at the same time, I was so repelled by the management that I had to leave um, the country. Uh, so this is, this is a bit of, this is all about the genesis of, of where I'm going. All right, 
But at Francis's place, like, I started to realize he had nothing in order. There was nothing in order in terms of bloom. There was nothing in order in terms of drop. So like with bloom, if you spray a lot, and he sprayed a lot, a lot, a lot. Like his spray schedule was like weekly. You spray every Monday, no matter what. And if it's gonna rain, you spray before the rain. And so we, we sprayed a lot, and that meant I was in like a Tyvek suit running behind the tractor, um, flailing a spray wand, um, and he couldn't hear me, and so he would go too fast, and anyway, it was, it was a comedy of errors all the time, but uh, anyway, he, nothing was in order, and so I just sort of filed that away of like, when I have my own, when that day comes and I have my own orchard, I got to get some things in order, because this is just too much, um, and so that thus began the, the hunt for horticultural timing that I'll get into in a much nerdier way in just a moment. Uh, when you're an heirloom apple person, you have a lot of old books. One of the main books is the Of New York series. So like in the early 1900s, all these um, horticulturalists started compiling all the fruit data the fruit cultivars growing in New York at that time. Um, there are peach, the Peaches of New York book is seriously four inches thick. And today we have 20, I don't know, 30 varieties of peaches that are pretty, I mean, you mostly see like five in the, in the catalogs today, but you, do not, you don't see four inches thick of peaches. And apples, there were, in 1905, there were 17,000 apple varieties. And today, we're looking at about 4,000. And so for me, in my hunt for low spray and no spray, genetics are a definite part of that. Like, we have failed, you know, our forefathers have failed us in fruit growing by, being, by choosing the completely wrong things to breed for one of which is being the crisp characteristic, which I'm going to bitch about for just a minute, <laughs> because we're not eating Doritos. Apples don't need to be Doritos that you can hear somebody bite into from across the way. There's so many other better characteristics, but in trying to breed for like the snap, we're not breeding for the disease resistance, and they're soaking these things and everything. And so it's really important, to me anyway, to value the disease resistance of apples, and a lot of the heirlooms have that. A lot of the heirlooms, at least, I'm, I'm defaulting to apples right now because that's the language I, my first language. But uh, that's how, like, having all those genetics, saving all those genetics is how we get better genetics. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of built-in disease resistance, um, or at least disease tolerance in the older stuff. And so, with a quickly dwindling population of apples, uh, I had to do something. Um, so this is just one of the many. You know, I read about this old famous apple tree and all of its accolades, and I actually figure, I'm a fruit explorer, I'm super nerdy about it, and I figure it out, and I go there, and this literally had been pushed over two weeks before I got there. Um, and I, I angrily, um, and sort of manically uh, knocked on the door of the farmer there, and he was, push he was pushing out 40 acres of orchard a, a year um, with a bulldozer because he had had it. He was done with growing fruits. And so that's, that's where I was like, we got to save it. How do I save this biodiversity? You got to give it a purpose. Um, and so a lot of a lot of, at least in the apple world, a lot of biodiversity has been saved through hard cider, thank goodness. Like the seedling revolution is upon us in, in many ways where all of a sudden there's more uses for this fruit than just uh, to bite into it and hear it from across the room. And so I started to think, like, how could I, how could I preserve it? And really I came to the, con the conclusion that the way I'm going to have to, have to save it is through animals. But that was a long, I'll take you, we're going on that journey. All right, so I decided on animals. Um, I, in Kyrgyzstan, all these wild fruit forests have animals in the understory. And I quickly came to understand that it's a symbiosis. Like 
fertilization de de deposition, um, feedstuffs falling from the sky, uh, certain insect tolerances, and, and anyway, it's all very integrated, and that's what I needed to do. So basically, uh, I went over to Kyrgyzstan, and they had these walnut and apple forests. The cattle are, are brought in, cattle and sheep are brought in before the nut harvest. Nuts are like their primary um, kind of their primary crop. And so anyway, they bring the cattle in to reduce the grass layer of uh, underneath the nuts so they can see it. And then when the cattle are like browsing on the grass, grazing the grass and getting it, to lo getting it lower, they're also eating pieces of the black walnut leaves that have fallen, premature fruit that have fallen, you know, branches that have fallen. These cattle are going after that too, which is a natural dewormer. Um, meanwhile, the apples that are growing with the walnuts, uh, walnuts have a, have a chemical called juglone, which is a very volatile chemical, and so it puts off a smell that is a natural insecticide. And so a lot of the insects kind of steer clear, like a lot of the apple pests steer clear of these um, fruits because of the proximity of walnut. And if there is an insect, then that fruit drops, the cows come in, they eat it, and they disrupt life cycles. And, and so like that, yeah, that insect can't come back up and live in the tree again. And so then there's harvesting, and it's all like one great cycle. So you get organic beef out of this, you get parasite-free, you know, you, it's eating, it's gaining weight through underneath the orchard. You get a clear harvest path for the, your walnuts, and also you get pretty disease-resistant apples. Um, and so when I saw that, I was like, ah, I got to do this. But I have no experience with, with cows. And so what I do have experience with pigs, um, November 20th, I celebrated my pet pig's 21st birthday. Um, she won't die. And... Uh, <laughs> I got her when I was in eighth grade, and so I know how to do pigs fairly well at this point. At least I know how to keep them alive for two decades. All right, so I decided that I needed to integrate pigs with the orchards that I had, or the orchards that I was leasing. So my goals were like, all right, I want to give them some shade because everybody likes shade. I want pigs to be excited to eat all the time, and I want to produce really happy pork. So I had this whole new methodology. I was in an orchard. I put pigs in it. They were doing great things. They drastically lowered my plum curculio rates, which is a weevil. They were helping me with coddling moth. They were fertilizing at certain times, which I couldn't figure out was good or bad at the time. And then they um, were keeping the grass down. So it was great. And I was like, OK, this is the way to go. I'm going to have fruits. And I'm going to have pigs. And so why don't I just plant orchards four pigs and basically one of my, you know, multi-tier, multi-structured orchards where I have uh, pigs in the understory that are applying, that are uh, giving me annual income and then I'll have like cider fruit. Um, but I also want to have orchards that feed these animals. So pigness of the pig was one of the big goals. And what I did there was I started to think about, I'm, I'm a super fruit nerd. And so I'm a member of uh, the North American Fruit Explorers, NAFEX, which if any of you want to get into this sort of n nerdery, you should join NAFEX. Um, also, the Northern Nut Growers Association, or NNGA, average age of a member of either of those organizations is probably 75, maybe 80, maybe 85. <laughs> but I started to identify all of these different cultivars who, that were going to drop fruit for the entire life of a pig, of at least the pigs I wanted to raise, which were, it was going to be like seven months. That was my goal, a seven-month drop scheme. All right, so throughout the South, now I'm from the South, throughout the South there were planted mulberry persimmon orchards, and this is uh, turn of the 19th century, ending in probably around 1875 or so, probably just after the Civil War, maybe up until 1900, um, is when these things were really cranking out fruits. So they planted ever-bearing mulberries 
In my zone, I'm in zone 7A. In my zone, an ever bearing, uh, the Hicks will drop from uh, basically June 1st until uh, August 1st. And the older the tree gets, the more it drops. It's prolific. That's what it's known for. It's prolific amount of fruit. So you're looking at like uh, an eight-year-old tree will drop a quart of mulberries a day for 90 days. Um, and so that's not to balk at. And so for just thinking about in the past, like this is how they fed a lot of their animals. I mean, they'd also bring in corn, but this was a huge part of this, the feed bill. Supplementing the feed bill was keeping them in these orchards. And so, yeah, you have tons of mulberries dropping every day. And they were originally planted at 40 by 40 spacings, by the way. Um, but that's not necessary. You could totally get way closer than that these days. Um, and mulberries are heavy feeders, so things, um, pigs actually have quite a bit of nitrogen, um, both in their poo and in their pee, and I think it actually totals more than chickens. It's just that chickens get, it's all mixed together, and so you get one value, one, one value for, for nitrogen, but with pigs, if you measure their urine and then you measure their, their poo, um, it's actually a little bit higher. But anyway, having them under the trees and for mulberries is very good, and it's very circular in that way. You will get more, the more uh, nutrients and heat actually a mulberry has, uh, the longer it will produce. And so for me, like in talking about climate adaption strategies, mulberries are where it's at. Um, and I'll go a little bit further. I love mulberries. Um, but if you want to talk about climate warming up and having a drought and, you know, Needing, needing fruit and needing leaf uh, fodder as well, that's where to go. All right, but here's the other thing about, about mulberries is that it is the oldest cultivated crop in, America, in, in the world. O oldest cultivated like agroforestry crop in the world. Um, silk industry is why. Silkworms feed primarily off of mulberries in, in order to produce high quality silk. They, they fed off of them in the wild, and they noticed this like six or 7,000 years ago. And so then began the cultivation of the mulberry and for leaf fodder. And so silkworms are monogastrics. They're a high, they have a high nutrient need and a high protein need. And so, uh, so do our livestock. And it turns out mulberry leaves are one of the most digestible, highest mineralizing, highest protein fodders we have. It goes toe to toe. It has a higher digestibility than alfalfa. It's got, it goes toe to toe in, in uh, protein amounts of alfalfa, only it's perennial in this, in, well, it's perennial, it's a hardy perennial that is drought tolerant. So in the middle of summer, when a lot of your grass is dying, uh, you can easily just start cutting mulberry leaves. So that's a big part of what I'm doing these days is messing around with and learning um, what we can tolerate, what the mulberries can tolerate in my climate in terms of harvest, because I want to get as many leaves off of them as I can. Um, I've continued on in my quest to plant orchards for livestock. And uh, oaks were next, are next on the list. I've created a, a scheme for oaks. I'm looking for oaks that drop basically 20, bushel, 20 to 30 bushels of acorns a year and more regularly. And so that's a genetic thing too. And there's also like frost times and things like that. So what I'm, I've been going deep into, uh, you know, talking with like presidents of international oak societies for different countries and all sorts of stuff. And, um, and I've got lists and a list of oaks that work. And I'm also very interested in um, the idea of a columnar oak. Uh, there's columnar species of almost everything these days. But wait, basically, that's like not a very wide tree. It just gets pretty tall. And so um, that alone lets you space trees quite. It kind of is mimics the high density, only these are like big boy, big girl trees that are able to fend for themselves in the wild and they don't need irrigation and constant f fertigation and things like that. And so um, I'm, comp I'm compiling uh, a whole 
database of oaks that, of oak, gener, specific old oak cultivars. And that's what I'm talking about here, like specific apple cultivars, specific, because this, in, that right now, this information exists. And hopefully, if this sort of system takes off, every new one found in the wild will be cataloged away to, for that information. Seedling orchards will get started to, uh, and, and that's part of their evaluation is when their drop time is and along with their disease resistance. You know, the future is, it, you, can, it's, you can expand on everything. Like, there is no stopping this whatsoever. But for right now, there exist cultivars with information. And so that's what I'm tapping into is the, on the horticultural side of things, that horticultural timing. Chinkapins is another one that I'm really into. Um, I've got chinkapin cultivars that drop from uh, probably the, well, like August 5th through November. Um, by the way, I know there's a lot of chestnut people here, and they're like, why chink? I always get that. Why chinkapins? Chinkapins produce, they yield just as much per volume of tree. It's just that they're smaller, but their flavor is amazing, and they have a pretty decent tolerance to uh, chestnut blight. So I'm, I'm really into this. It's not too small to not keep the pigs interested. The uh, fat content also of chinkapins is quite a bit higher than any uh, Chinese American or Asian American hybrid that exists. Um, it goes toe to toe with American chestnuts. And so, yeah, the only issue is the size, but you know what else eats these things? Turkeys. Right around the time when you're trying to fatten up turkeys for Thanksgiving, these things start dropping, and there's almost nothing more delicious in my mind than a chinkapin fed turkey, but poultry will eat them, chick pigs will eat them, everything eats them. They're delicious. I eat them. Black walnuts is another one that, that I'm working on. Um, black walnuts are uh, one of the fewer studied species that we, native species that we have. Um, the the o walnut forest in like Kyrgyzstan is Carpathian or English walnut or what became English walnut after it traveled there. Um, and so uh, I've been interested in black walnut mostly because, so there's this idea of terroir, that like sense of that soil being transposed into your products basically. I think that I can best achieve that with black walnut because uh, black walnut is the oils in, the nut oils are, are fat soluble. So all of a sudden, this black walnut is going straight to the pig fat. And also, the, they're very volatile. The juglones put out that volatile, like, I don't know if you've eaten many black walnuts, but they're like a tropical bouquet, sort of. And um, so, I think this is the best chance at, at totally changing the flavor of pork. We talk, you, you hear Iberico for acorns, um, but acorns have no volatility. Like you get that, mar you know, you can get the flavor. You could tell it's a changed flavor, like because it's not grain or it is half grain, half whatever. But um, to me, like black walnuts are probably where it's at. And there is so much really to be, to be found. And a lot of it is the work of people 100 years ago who started putting these known cultivars in the landscape and they're just hybridizing with wild and creating amazing stuff. And so we overlook them or we think about them as pain, you know, being nuisances, but really there's a good chance, especially like emanating from these Quaker towns or from like TVA plantings or like do your historical research on who was the most badass horticulturalist in your area. And, and what they were excited about, and start looking in radius ring in, you know radius rings around where they lived. Uh, so hickories are also one of those things. So they hi readily hybridize with pecans. So like in my area, where they planted northern pecans, it's not their native range of northern pecan, but but people planted them there, and then they started hybridizing with the local hickories. And so I've got. Loads of trees that are half that are you know showing uh, you know, phenotypic ratios of pretty good nut, pretty good pecan, and pretty good hickory. And so the the idea there is to have better nut meats, to have thinner shells. Um, you know, basically for us, but as well for me, I'm looking at it for the livestock. I want them to have thinner shells just so they don't have to struggle as much. 
but they will eat thick shelled everything because um, they know this stuff is delicious. All right, so I wanted to figure out, first of all, like paddock size. Paddock size is orchard size. So I've got like you know, all those lists of cultivars and I've got all their drop dates and I've got all these attributes about them, but they only make sense for me anyway if I am able to match the carrying capacity, essentially. So like, we've got the grass as the care, you know, grass is one thing for our livestock for them to eat, but uh, also I've got this tree layer. And so estimating yields of trees dropping, so just trying to figure out pounds per pig per square feet per day the grow rate and how, um, how long I could keep animals. Basically just trying to figure out like one pig would take how many days, you know, how many days for how many pounds to move. So a 40 pound pig for me after, that, after this experiment yield needed about 1.2 square feet per pound. And so that means 48 square feet per pig per day. And that's literally how I have laid out my orchard paddocks, is um, how much land do I have? And I sort of reverse engineer that. Uh, and so that's, this is what it is. I've done it by month, square feet per month per pig. Um, and that gave me total of 0.75 acres per pig per life cycle. And for that, I, uh, I, have seven, I had seven and a half acres. And so that means I could have 10 pigs. And this is, by the way, with no grain supplementation, thinking about it in, in that way. And so what this is, then, is combining all that drop data that I've got into these paddock sizes, so the spacings these trees need, the yields, the yields they'll offer, all of that into these monthly paddock sizes. And so you know, I'm creating flow through the landscape with these orchards. And that's not just livestock, that works for people too. You know, this is like, this is like the beginning of a very diversified you pick. Except for I just wait a little bit longer and have everything drop on the ground so I don't pick, nobody picks anything but the pigs eat things. To be clear, there are risks associated with hog civil pasture. Pigs' natural behavior is rooting and when we have a forage-based system, this really relies on their ability to dig for their meals. So this rooting behavior, particularly when it leads to excessive soil disturbance and erosion and even tree damage, this has been mitigated commercially by ringing pigs and putting a ring through their noses. This compromises their welfare and ultimately their ability to effectively feed, which then compromises the effectiveness of the whole system. So how do we balance this? Ultimately, the key is judicious management that will mitigate that excessive soil disturbance. What this looks like could be hyperfrequent rotation or planting species that drop fruit and nuts at different times so that animals aren't in one place for an extended period of time. Or even planting disturbance resilient forage species to have greater ground cover that will tolerate that rooting behavior. So should we keep pigs in trees? I think the answer is yes, but with care and careful management. So here we are. We want to be innovative and try new things, and there are likely going to be some mistakes and lots of learning along the way, which is why we want to continue to hear from you about your lessons learned and important insights. Reach out to us to share your story through our contact form at centerforagroforestry.org. As a reminder, this podcast is made in the place we know now as Missouri, on the lands of the Osage, Oto, Missouri, Iowa, Alini, Sac and Fox, Kickapoo, Peoria, and Sioux peoples. Our theme music is creative work of farmer Noah Earl, and Tim Pilcher produces the podcast. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay tuned by subscribing on any podcast app. Holding my tongue hasn't gone so well. I got truths to tell and I got spine So I made a list of your worst mistakes And I hope that you fall back in love